the compelling um, argument, if it's real, um, you know, for the field. So what kind of additional data would we really need to marshal to say we really need to parsect psychiatric diagnoses by this? So wrestling with what designs might work and how to pursue that. Great. Michael, you're up. Well, first, the deliverable I'd like, I'd love to be able to turn around to pediatricians and say, here's a test that you can use at the level of the individual child to see whether the adversity that you know that has occurred has had an impact that is predictive of a particular outcome, and it's deliverable and usable within your clinical practice. So the question then becomes, well, how do we do it? Um, I think there's a lot, obviously, that you heard. There's a lot of people who are very much on the right track. One of the things I think we haven't looked too much about is that the issues of comorbidities in pediatric settings. Um, there's more and more, you heard a bit about this, I think, from Bruce and from other people, but the developmental hypothesis is such that these comorbidities probably have perhaps a common origin but are interfacing. I'm still trying to grapple with the fact that one of my young psychiatrist residents has just handed me data showing that in a longitudinal study, um, the presence of eczema at 18 or 24 months of age predicts a five-fold increase in the risk for ADHD. Friggin' eczema, okay? You think I measured that? No. So, but that's where I'd like to get to. I'd like to turn around and find out how do we know which kid's gonna go. Yeah, and Christine. Yeah, thank you, Michael. That's actually the question I get most in emails from, from survivors. How can we find an objective diagnostic test to, to verify experiences? So I can only add to what, what my colleague said. I would back every single statement from everybody in the panel. What I feel um, strongly about is to do a better job in, in my research to establish causality, because most is cross-sectional, especially if we study adults and long-term consequences, so we do need large-scale longitudinal cohorts. I think we do have to put cohorts also together, because we cannot start at zero and go until 80 years now, and maybe use what we have established already and combine it to, to answer new questions. And um, I feel uh, particularly strong about reversibility. Many of the biological systems that we find uh, changed by early adversity could be modified, probably, and we discussed that a lot, or counteracted. And I think um, we had that discussion yesterday. I think we shouldn't be afraid to also explore pharmacological uh -huh. new ways to treat the consequences of child maltreatment. And um, as we heard also today from Dr. Bradley's Bex talk, FKBP5 is one target that could be modified. One can block expression of FKBP5 and that could normalize glucocorticoid regulation. And I think we have to go back into animal models informed by human research findings and um, ask such questions. And that, that can also help in establishing causality again. Um, what I also want to mention is um, picking um, up on what, what Marty Teicher uh, just said, the um, uh, periods of uh, the sensitive time windows, it would be, um, of course, a little bit futuristic, but um, how great would it be to have a pill that reopens such a time window, such a window of um, plasticity, and then combine that with um, psychotherapy with new experiences and by that we probably could have most efficient interventions but of course that's the future and the work by Takao Hensch and, and, and colleagues um, provides um, targets how this might be achieved. So I think I want to advocate for the use of also pharmacological ways to, to break, um, to, to remove the breaks on plasticity and, and to combine that with uh, psychosocial interventions. Good, let's open this up to some of the other speakers to Bruce, C. Don, Mike, Andrea. What are you, some of your thoughts that are additive to, to what's been said here? Let's hear from some of you. The microphones are here, so just let Erica or Carlo know. Uh, thank you. Um, Thank you very much for your comments and, and the thoughtfulness. I guess I had one thought to add uh, about the uh, deliverables question or about, about the earlier question you asked about how do you actually disseminate this. Um, you know, when I think about that question, it, 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 dissemination has to be done very thoughtfully. It has to be done very purposefully. Uh, maybe the most 
the, the mo one of the most uh, evidence-based interventions that we have uh, in schools is, is the good behavior game. And the good behavior game has about 40 years of scientific support behind it, many randomized trials. We know that it's an intervention that reduces antisocial behavior, increases pro-social behavior, and facilitates uh, better learning environments in school. And yet, until 10 years ago, nobody used the good behavior game except for scientists doing studies because it wasn't accessible. Now, about 10 years ago, my colleague Dennis Embry spent two years investing in creating a disseminable view uh, version of the good behavior game. Uh, him and his company actually created all the materials uh, where, they have, you know, where they have a package and they provide training and they provide everything you need. And now, with, with a version of it that anybody can use, it's in more than 10,000 schools. So, you know, once you have a product, it's not just about communicating or talking, it's about very consciously and very purposefully creating a product that can be easily disseminated to others, that can go, th that is in a version, not the version you see in scientific journals, but is in a usable version for schools and right. for families and for counselors right. and so forth. Right. It's a great analogy, Bruce. Uh, one other one, uh, who, who wants to say something else? From Andrea? Yeah. So I, I agree with many of the points that uh, uh, people made. Uh, an additional one could be, I think, uh, thinking about the opposite direction. So thinking about how to uh, work with practitioner rather than giving to practitioner, mm -hmm. um, but thinking about what they can give to research. And I think we have a number of actually very effective uh, clinical interventions. And I think one thing that I would really like to understand is how they work. Uh, because if we understand how they work, we might be able to then um, be able to understand w how we can modify them to make them work better uh, for more people, for example. But I think uh, also starting from the clinical perspective and try to understand how that works could be quite valuable. Great. Mike, did you just want to say one thing? Okay. Similar, okay. So, uh, well, Denny, let's hear from you. Idan, and she has a follow-up. Oh, uh, Idan first, and then Denny. And then, and then we're going to move to the next one, because it's oh, along sorry. these lines. Th this, is, this is going to be short. Um, I, don't, I don't have much to add uh, in terms of kind of the next steps. I agree with Christine. Uh, personally, I'm, I'm very interested in understanding the causal mechanisms. I think we're coming from the same place. Um, but I think we have a lot of uh, the answers, a lot of the pieces of the puzzles out there. We just need to kind of combine them together. You know, so Nature had a special issue, uh, I think it was last week, uh, about why interdisciplinary research matters. Um, and, and they had um, a specific paper about um, funding agencies that it's really difficult to get funding uh, because they don't really understand, it's still very, supportive of this one discipline, even though we understand that we really need to combine forces, we don't really understand everything by ourselves. We need to combine um, different expertise and there's a lot of the advancement come from new technology, so this is really kind of interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary type of uh, research and um, th this is what I see kind of the next steps for science. And I think one of the points of one of those articles in that uh, a journal was that multidisciplinary doesn't mean multi-level per se. It means how does the field of child maltreatment grow with the field of stress, grow with the field of aging? How do different fields grow together? How do we inform each other's science, not just multiple level? So that's a really good point. Uh, Danny, let's hear from you and then we'll move. Okay. Um, after having a, an NIH conference grant and a, a number of other activities, we developed a, a national organization, the National Prevention Science Coalition to Improve Lives, and we're made up of scientists from across the disciplinary spectrum, um, educators, clinicians, practitioners, advocates, policymakers, community organizations. We're also aligned with a number of national organizations. Um, the CDC, the Administration for Children and Families, and I could go on. Um, and the whole idea is exactly what you all are talking about, to very intelligently and strategically communicate the science very carefully to public and private sectors to try to make use out of what we do know and what has been replicated. And so it really resonates with what everybody is talking about here. On our board of directors is Mos Moshi Sif. 
yeah. and, um, and Dennis Embry and uh, Susan Anderson and um, a number of people that you will know. Um, and we have a, a translational science subcommittee that specifically distills science for the understanding by public and private sectors. We do con um, congressional briefings, we do op-eds. Um, we also have an implementation committee and we, um, we engage in advocacy. Um, and so um, this is the sort of thing that we're trying to do. We're trying to get to the point where we can identify evidence-based programs from a scientific level. We want to understand what the mechanisms of change are um, and then scale up and eventually institutionalize and then ultimately change public opinion with respect to what's really important in child development. So I just wanted to bring great, that to Danny, your attention. Yeah, it's a great model okay. to follow. Um, Carla, will you just hand the microphone to Victor over there? And so we the have another follow-up back here too, Jenny. Um, where? Over this way. Oh, one follow-up. Good, <laughs> good. And then we're going to switch topics. I want to thank you for your words toward advocacy. I have to say, as a child psychiatrist, I think of myself as an advocate first and a clinician second. Uh, over the years, I've certainly uh, spent a minimal amount of hours in advocacy, but the minimal hours I've spent in advocacy have returned much more than the hundreds and hundreds of hours I've spent as a clinician. One example is, uh, you know, uh, back in North Carolina, I teamed up with a group of people and there was a movement in the state to provide funding for 200,000 young children to get quality childcare. We were able to work well with the legislature and was able to get that through. And getting funding for 200,000 children to get quality childcare uh, meant a tremendous amount to that state. And it was leveraged by further resp response later on. As a teacher, I regularly take residents and fellows to meet their representatives to realize that they can be an advocate, they can meet with their legislators. There's any a number of things. Uh, as an individual, teaming up with a group of people, we put together the Child Advocate website, which gets a modest view of 60,000 page views a month. And if you know anybody who wants to offer a chapter on that that's meaningful to the public and would help persuade them, I've certainly gotten good views and feedback from authors who've done that in terms of boosting their book sales and extending their run. So Great. thank you for Great. the advocacy Great. words Great. that you put in. Great. Um, okay, we're going to switch to the l probably the last topic we're going to have time for. And that is a question we're going to start up here with the panel, but I want to make sure we hear from Victor. Um, what's the best intervention that's never been tested? What's out there that we haven't tried yet? What do you, there's a lot of people talking about alternative kinds of ways of thinking about strategies to promote coping and reduce stress and so forth. One example is mindfulness or something that it would increase um, flexible coping. You know, let's th think about in your, in your strategies, um, what's the best intervention that's never been tested? Rough play. <laughs> Tell us about that. Is it sort of an inoculation? I'm sort of piggybacking on Richard Tremblay's work, but um, yeah, just interactive, highly social, vigorous physical play. What's the mechanism? Oh, I don't know. You asked for an intervention. You didn't ask for a mechanism. Well, I can't, no, I can't give you. <laughs> Martin, what's I, the mechanism? I can't do it without a mechanism. Why? Why could you not do it without a mechanism? What do you care if it works? You said, uh, sure. what's the mechanism there? It's, it's the play more. Yeah. Vic Victor, you want to weigh in on this? Okay. Well, I, I don't know. <laughs> but, um, you know, we've talked about all of these factors that are, uh, or that we think are important in resilience. It would be good to do a longitudinal randomized controlled trial on an intervention that provides uh, a lot of those components to children at risk and follows with a controlled group. And, you know, it will just take 10 years to be able to see some outcomes. That's the one thing I can Erica. think of. 
Erica, could we get the microphone up here? Bruce wants to weigh in on this too. So this is a question that I uh, addressed in my talk that I gave, but I'll just say it again. The intervention that's never been done that I believe desperately needs to be done and developed is to study and understand how children from high adversity context, what they're good at in terms of learning, in terms of memory, in terms of reasoning and problem solving, and then to use, and then to work with that, to use that to leverage better interventions rather than just trying to work against it, which is primarily what we do now. You know, some of the best research lately from uh, aging, the field of aging is to study um, centenarians, those who have lived the longest, and what have we learned at every level from those who survived. So that's, that's kind of what you're saying. Any, anything else? Yes, Danny Perkins. Right, so um, you go ahead, Marty, and then I'll follow up on that. Um, I'll, I'll put in a plug for uh, Bessel van der Kolk and um, his book, the, How the Body Keeps Score. Um, and Bessel's been very interesting. He's been interested in, in trauma and post-traumatic stress for, for many decades. Uh, he was the first to come up with, showed evidence that SSRIs are helpful. Um, and he could have spent his whole career doing that, but he's never rested on one thing. He's keeping on looking for something that's better. And he's really gone off into a number of different directions, finding some very powerful things. Um, yoga, he's been, he studied with high levels of success. He's getting uh, some remarkable results with, with tango dancing, um, neurofeedback. Um, you know, it's, there's a lot of potential things, I think, that in the area of the play and exercise, that would be very valuable. I think that we do need to really look for um, experiences that um, may have an impact on plasticity and, and and this is guided by trying it in patients, see what works and then it really needs to go into um, randomized control trials but we need to be open to possibilities and only when we establish when it works will we figure out the mechanism. Great. All right, we've got a few minutes left so what we're going to do with those few minutes is from each of you up there. I want you to give a short 30 second or one minute advice or charge to the next generation of science, the scientists. It should be on already. Yeah. No. Okay. Um, be ready to train kids from the very beginning to be interested in interdisciplinary research. Great, not even 30 seconds. George? Um, study individual differences and don't read discussion sections. <laughs> <laughs> Marty. Uh, I, I'm not sure if I can follow that. Um, from a very personal level, what's had a big influence on my research that I think might translate to other people starting is I've really enjoyed and did a lot of computer programming and really embraced the new technologies, be very proficient with that, because I think that there's going to be an enormous way that things are going to expand. Um, 
into the area of big data and big data analytics. Great. Yeah, I, I it's complete the individual differences, big data, and break down silos. I mean, let's you know get rid of medical silos and uh, particularly with children. Um, and get rid of the concept of stress, for God's sakes. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a horrible thing. Um, just speak about adversities, individual differences. Okay. The concept of stress is belaboring. Okay. Christine? Yeah, maybe also the concept of nature and nurture. Nature versus nurture, I just uh, want to add. And um, what I would say to young scientists is um, what, um, uh, yeah, don't be afraid to, to think outside of the box and look uh, across the blade of, of what you learn and, and are trained during your studies and um, that's only how we can really make progress if we don't repeat what, what has been done before and we have to be creative and, and, and also yeah, be integrative, <laughs> talk to people and, um, and go to conferences and, and try to think outside the box. Great. Okay, that brings us to the end. Um, we're going to have to say goodbye because we have planes, uh, several planes to catch. Just a couple of thank yous. I want to thank all of our conference speakers. Um, I know how incredibly busy you are, and for you to come to Central PA during this time of the semester is a, is a huge sacrifice. So thank you for helping us leap over your backs the, these last two days. Thank you so much. Let's give a big hand. Thank you so much. And, and uh, please, Sandy Kyler, oh, she's not here, where'd she go? She organized everything. Thank you, Sandy, so much. Thank you, Taylor, for doing all the blogging. Susan McHale, you made everything possible. Please, please. The Penn State community, thank you all for showing up. All of you who skipped class, woohoo! All of you who skipped, uh, who stopped teaching today, thank you for coming. Um, and, and, and finally, the community members that came, please don't stop the conversation. Please bug us. Please email us. Please help us understand your concerns. Help us understand the best questions. It's only through you that this science is going gonna, is gonna to make any difference. And finally, to the network faculty, Chad, Idan, Hannah, Carlo, Erica, I think we have our charge, okay? Thank you all so much. Mm -hmm.